Hello friends and greetings for the day. Welcome back to another tutorial on ISTQB Advanced Level Test Management Certification. We are in Chapter 1 talking about managing mm -hmm. the test activities and uh, still continuing with 1.3 that is risk-based testing. And today we shall be looking forward to continue with the next sub-segment that is 1.3.4 Quality Risk Mitigation Through Appropriate Testing. And as a part of this, we will try understanding what it takes for the testing team to define the mitigation steps when a requirement or risk has been analyzed. As a part of our previous tutorials, we have already discussed a lot about it, that what is the risk all about, then what kind of risk identification techniques we have, and then what exactly happens when it comes to the risk assessment. Of course, as a response to the risk, which is given as a part of the risk assessment, also the level of risk is defined. We are now required to build or implement those activities which would help mitigate those risks. But indeed, as a part of the risk assessment itself, we give a response to it that can we mitigate this risk or we will transfer this or we will accept it or we may have to define some contingencies which will only be actionable when the risk becomes an actuality, right? But if you have responded to risk as mitigation, then we define what is that recommended action item to be done in order to mitigate the risk. Quite often people misunderstand this, that risk assessment does not talk about it, but mitigation is the phase where we define what to do. Answer is no, assessment defines what to do and mitigation phase is all about implementing it. So say for example, you have a risk identified during the risk analysis and as a part of the risk assessment, you recommended conducting a particular level like performance testing to be executed for 1000 users and response time to be measured as less than or equal to 1.5 seconds. Same way a security threat has been identified or security weaknesses have been identified as a risk, then we are now going to conduct risk, uh, sorry, security testing uh, in the dynamic levels. And we also now propose that one of the mitigation action would be to have the security tester involved right from the design phase to participate in design reviews, code reviews, etc. Now, all these things will be basically refined or defined as a part of assessment itself. Implementing it is what we call it as risk mitigation. And that's where we are now going to talk about that what are those activities which we can actually consider as a part of the mitigation. And in simple words, we say that any any such activity which you think as a manager could be you know possible to re reduce the level of risk is certainly recommended be about hiring a person be it about conducting a particular level test type test method test techniques or even if i say that getting into a workshop organizing a training ramping up your resources can all be seen as one of the possible mitigation actions so let's take it more technical and understand what the content is trying to say and let's cover that in more detail. So to get started with, of course, the first part is trying to talk about the outline what we just discussed. So in software development, testing is the most important quality risk mitigation activity and makes it possible to reduce the likelihood of the failures. Other possible risk mitigation measures include a contingency plan, which is by providing the workarounds, risk transfer to a third party or even risk acceptance. In test planning, the time and effort associated with developing and executing a test should be proportional to the risk level. Indeed, uh, we have discussed this always in the beginning, but however, we would like to remind you once again, uh, when we talk about risk-based testing, it is always important to understand that the team is looking forward to conduct proportionate amount of testing to that of the risk level. All I mean by saying that is if you have a risk of high level, uh, certainly we'll do more testing there compared to that of medium. And same way, when you have medium level risk identified, you will do proportionally more testing than that of low level risk identified. Let's add further to this, of course, uh, testing for higher risk level should start as early as possible in the life cycle and should use more rigorous test techniques, while testing for lower risk levels may start later and should use less rigorous test techniques. And indeed, that goes with the statement what we just discussed, the amount of effort and the amount of testing we do for high risk would be higher or more compared to that of medium and low, respectively. Further to add here, of course, to best mitigate the overall risk through testing, the test manager should analyze the following contextual factors and select an appropriate test approach. 
And here on high level, we're just trying to list those things which can be considered as a recommended mitigation activities. To start with, of course, the first thing is the test item itself. That is, the different test item within a test object may have different level of the same risk type. So as a test object, uh, so a test object does not need to be tested with uniform rigor. We need to understand how the things are being critically distributed. Some may require a little more effort. So it's more about reminding you one thing that we should not under test any certain thing which might require additional testing. So for low, if you do limited testing, that makes sense. For medium, if I do something good, that's enough. But for high, I should not underestimate things. I should not under test it. So that's where we are saying that the rigor level or rigorous testing amount to be done should be accordingly analyzed, okay? Just randomly doing it does not do the needful and does not fulfill the goal of testing also. The second important thing here, of course, is to talk about the quality characteristic, which is associated with the risk. So risk, effect, risk affecting specific quality characteristics should be mitigated by associated test types, which need specific test effort, test environment, or testing skills as well, which indeed talks about the quality characteristics, which should not be underestimated. And certainly the requirement could be specific sometime. You may need to have a specific environment or a particular test skill like hiring a performance test engineer to do performance testing or security test engineer to do security testing and so on and so forth. So all of these would be one of my key constraints as a factor to be considered while defining the amount of testing to be done. Let's add further to this, of course, uh, the next set of items include the next one as the test level and the test type. However, we discussed this already, but quickly to talk about certain risk may only be tested dynamically on particular test levels. Others by static testing also, which is like static analysis and reviews, or by combination of both as well. That is by a review of the architecture and dynamic testing of integrated system for security vulnerabilities. Testing every test item as early as possible mitigates the risk of finding critical defects late in the life cycle which would cause higher internal failure cost and delays. So the basic principle applies everywhere that if you think you have more critical items to deal with, we always look forward to prioritize them in the life cycle and try to engage with them as early as possible because the cost of dealing with the failure of these critical items would be cheaper early in the life cycle because of less rework or less workaround to be done rather than being later in the life cycle. So we always prompt that the prioritization should also take place and we should address the critical items as early as possible. The next item here to talk about is the overall SDLC itself. So the test activities have their own specific entry criteria. Various SDLC fulfill them at different times. That is to just make sure that the SDLC models should be well aligned to that of the test activities and how are we addressing them. The next one is the test team. The most qualified people should test the test item with the highest level of risk. Again, I cannot just ask someone randomly to work on a particular item. If I think this is a high priority risk to be dealt with, I would prefer someone who is more experienced in testing. And in, in case there's an item which with, with low risk, I would also encourage a newcomer probably with one year or lesser experience to try out this uh, at its own level. Because I know things may go here and there, but this person can still handle it with the limited experience what this person has. So allocating the resources and the team skills what is required to perform that plays a vital role. I just can't ask a random test engineer to perform any activity. And the final thing here, of course, to talk about is the regulatory requirements. So some safety related standards like IEC 61508 standard prescribe the recommended test techniques and the required coverage based on the integrity level. The test manager has to ensure that these standards are followed so of course, sometimes uh, it's not that we can, as a test manager, take all the decisions. Sometimes the standard bodies which govern the project or the product will also have recommendations depending on different factors. So if in case they have recommendations, we may have to get aligned to that and we may not have any other options to move around. For example, ISO 26262 and uh, AC level for automotive, right? They do have method tables to do the recommendations and they indeed look forward to give you recommendations for what technique to be used for, which integrity, safe, safety integrity level, okay? So that's what is ASIL stands for, Automotive Safety Integrity Level. So that's a particular example to understand that how sometimes these standards would also be able to define what to be done for which type of risk. 
Let's add further to this. Our discussion further continues with respect to that of the prioritization. So in addition, the risk level should influence quality control decisions such as the use of review of work product like test cases, the level of independence of testing from development, and the extent of regression testing to be performed. During test monitoring and control, the risk-based testing allows reporting on the test progress in terms of the residual risk level at any point of time. This supports the development team and stakeholders in monitoring and controlling the software development, including making release decisions based on the residual risk level. This certainly requires reporting test results in terms of risk in a way stakeholders can understand. So first part here is certainly talking about that uh, we should, uh, beyond these common factors, we should also look forward to have the level of independence to be defined, like sometimes few things require some additional uh, independency. For example, if I have a risk associated, I would preferably ask the non-functional tester to do that security testing instead of grooming up my functional testers to become a security tester. Or if you think you have a user-friendliness issue or a risk identified there, instead of asking my functional team to perform that, I would hire you know, people who are expert in that or maybe even out outsource it to the expert organization who will be dealing with this. So there could be many such factors which we can really include and you know consider them in terms of defining what should be best done in order to deal with the defect, sorry, the risk. So indeed, uh, that's one thing. And certainly to add further, the next levels is like monitoring and control is about consistently keeping an eye on the known risk and the emerging risk. Over a period of time, as the project unfolds, as the project data comes up, we start looking at the product as we start interacting with it, we certainly identify a lot of new defects. Or sometimes those existing defects may not be any longer the you know, risk as well. So that is where these risks may be continuously you know, reanalyzed for their existence, or at least for checking for new emerging risks. And that's where uh, Monitoring is more of like a consistent activity on all major milestones. And control is certainly to stay, keep the status report updated. Let the every stakeholder know in terms of the risk details that how many risks have been mitigated, how many more to go, what is the plan of action for that, so that everyone in the stakeholder knows about your plan of action with respect to the risk and the current status of it. And these reports should always be written in a way that these stakeholders can understand. It's not about like your stakeholders will always be technical. Sometimes you may have leadership, you may have managements, and you have other people who might not be really uh, clear with the technicality. So you may have to write your reports in a way with those data numbers, which represents that what's the statistics of the risk as of today. Also to add here, the next thing here is of course, during test implementation, the test prioritization is based on the risk level. During test execution, this ensures early coverage of most critical areas and mitigation of the highest level risk. And right here are two examples. Uh, when the test cases are basically executed in strict descending order of the level of risk they cover, starting with the highest first. That means, you know, the test associated with the risk one, which is highest priority, will be executed all the risk. Okay, sorry, just to conclude it, make it clear. When we talk about a particular risk, which is high priority, and when you try to run all the test cases and mitigate it fully, that's what we call it as depth first. So depth first approach basically looks forward to mitigate highest level risk as early as possible. So we perform all the executions related to that. Alternatively, the other approach we have is at least one test from each risk is assigned with highest priority. All other tests are prioritized based on their level of risk covered. And thus this approach is called as breadth first and is appropriate when stakeholders want an overall view of the product quality as early as possible. So here we try to execute one test from each risk, okay, parallel execution, just to make sure that we are touching base on every single risk which is open. And at the same time, we achieve required coverage from the whole product point of view. Just to picturize this to understand it better, if you still have any confusion, let's look at this particular diagram here. I've just put this into a tabulated form. And if you see, uh, the table consists of four risks in the sequence high, medium, medium, and low. And then for each risk, I have, say, for example, written four test cases, again, high, high, medium, and low. Now, if you execute it horizontally, that means test one of all the four risks, if it is executed first, then we call it as breadth first. So horizontal execution 
would be called as breadfast. But if I execute all the tests, that is T1, T2, T3, T4 of R1, that is risk one first, then I call it as depth first, which is basically a vertical execution. Now you may have a question in your mind that which one is better or what should be followed first. So we just gave you a quick heads up here that when it comes to, uh, you know, talking about the whole product in parallel, we prefer the breadth first. Whereas if you concentrate more on a critical risk to be mitigated altogether first, then you look at some other risk, you call it as depth first. So these are the two important points what I can consider to define which approach to use. However, there's nothing as a comparison between both the methods. You, can, you are free to choose your depth or breadth first as any option because both will have similar benefits, both will have similar drawbacks. So that's what the last point says here, that whether the risk-based testing proceeds depth first or breadth first or even the combined, the time allocated for testing may be consumed without all planned tests being run, which simply means one thing, in case you run out of time, both the techniques will have something left behind. So it's not that one of the techniques will cover everything and one of the techniques will not cover everything. So it's just that like whether you go vertically or you go horizontally, if the time runs out in the project, at least the last row or the last column will be left attended. Okay, so that's where we just wanted to say at this point, we would like to say that risk-based testing facilitates the provision of a justified recommendation to management, whether to extend testing or to accept the remaining risk. So in case you run out of time, the only option you have is to extend the testing or to define that we are accepting this risk for the time being. Okay, and we'll probably look forward to do something about it in the future. So with this, we have a complete rigid understanding of what it takes to mitigate a risk and what the testing team has to plan for or perform in terms of defining the mitigation action. So put together, that's all from this particular tutorial team. Should you have anything else, feel free to comment below. I'm always there to address your queries and answer them well. Till then, keep learning, keep exploring, keep understanding the context. Thanks for watching the video team and happy learning. Thank you.